I know you guys have a lot of questions following this news about Johnson and Johnson, so I would like to bring in an expert. I'm joined this morning by Dr. Todd Ellerin, Director of Infectious Diseases at South Shore Health and a regular contributor to ABC News. Good to see you again. Too. So, uh, Dr. Ellerin, I think one of the most common questions right now is those people who go, oh my gosh, I just got the vaccine yesterday or the day before or the day before. What should I do now? Is there anything to do? The first thing, Sonia, is we need to take a deep breath, okay? Because the bottom line is this is super rare. These unusual clots are occurring in less than one per million people who receive the J&J &J vaccine. So the majority of people very safe, very effective vaccine. But I think the safety pause is important because it seems to be affecting a younger population, females more than males. And so what we want to make sure is that it's this vaccine is okay for all age groups. And if not, the FDA and the CDC is going to really crunch these numbers and figure out, you know, should we pivot to alternative vaccines in this age group? Or is this um, so rare and and that the numbers in the background population of, of these type of clots, which do occur, are similar? And maybe they'll say we're going to continue going as is. But but this layer of safety is really what we're looking for um, as we prioritize safety for, for the masses. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, Dr. Ellerin, is like we're pausing now after six instances uh, of, of this type of clotting, and I'm wondering why now? What is the proper time frame to say, okay, now we've got to pause because it's been six people? It's an important point because remember, the pause isn't just about these six people, but if you remember the AstraZeneca vaccine has also had some rare clotting as well. And there is some similarities between the platform of AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. They're both what we call adenovirus or viral vector vaccines. So one of the things that the CDC and the FDA are gonna look at is, that, is there something about this type of um, platform that, um, increases the risk of, of these unusual clots, even though, of course, again, it is super rare. And I was on a media call a couple hours ago with the FDA and the CDC, and they were describing this, you know, because we we're, we're saying it's rare, but to, to people who are just listening, they're like, well, how do I know that I'm not going to be impacted? They were talking specifically about a combination of low platelets and a history of blood clots or blood clotting that would contribute to this. Yeah, there does seem to be this mechanism where um, these rare events are associated with um, low platelets. What's unusual is that platelets are supposed to stop bleeding or or clot. So, but then occasionally there are these conditions where you can actually have low platelet number and have a predisposition to clotting. And that's what may be happening here. It also looks like some of these patients have high titer antibodies that are directed against that platelet. So there may be a common mechanism between the clotting we're seeing with the AstraZeneca vaccine and the clotting we're seeing with the J&J &J vaccine. That still needs to be elucidated. That's not confirmatory at this point. And I know that we've been talking about timeline because a lot of people are interested in this part. If I just got the vaccine and it happened to be Johnson & Johnson, how long uh, should I be concerned about potential symptoms popping up? Uh, the FDA and CDC saying the median time frame is about nine days. Right, so so far all of the cases that have occurred in the United States have occurred within a two week time period. And remember, the age group so far has been 18 to 48. Now that's with the J&J &J, um, vaccine induced uh, clots. But, but I think for most people, again, there have been nearly 7 million J&J &J doses of vaccine that have been administered to date. So we're talking about six over 7 million. So I want people to keep that in perspective. Even when we, we take a, a penicillin, for example, there's a risk of a severe anaphylaxis in about one in 10,000 people. So just to put that into perspective, I'm not saying it, it's something we really want to scrutinize. And I think it's wonderful that, that the FDA and the CDC did put a safety pause on that. I think it makes sense. And some other countries in the European Union have said that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine outweighs the risks, but they have changed some of the age eligibility to uh, uh, to an older age group and, and looking for the younger people to get other types of, of vaccines. So that's the type of of work that, that the FDA and the CDC are going to do over the next few days. 
And finally, Dr. Ellerin, I want to make a, an important distinction between side effects or some of the symptoms that people may be concerned about with regard to what they're hearing today. We can see instances of uh, fatigue or fever or even a mild headache for a couple of days after receiving one of these vaccines, but that's different from what we're talking about today. I'm really happy you said that, Sonia, because it's so important. In the clinical trials, at least 5% of patients developed headaches. Remember, if almost 7 million people have gotten the dose, that means 350,000 people have had headaches after receiving the J&J vaccine. That's to be expected. In fact, what's interesting is the J&J vaccine overall has less side effects um, early after the shot than the messenger RNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. So again, you're right, we have to keep these things in perspective and really take a deep breath and know that for most people, this is a very safe and effective vaccine, irrespective of what the FDA and CDC decide to do. Dr. Todd Ellerin, thank you for your time this morning. Really thank appreciate you. it.